I personally think anywhere where, you know, a decision, individual driven decision is not needed, could be automated. I mean, that's my hypothesis. Hey, welcome everyone to another episode of uh, Inside Finance. Uh, I'm Ankur Bagheria, founder and CEO at Cashflow. Uh, today we have a very interesting uh, guest with us, uh, Mr. Swayam. Uh, Swayam, uh, of course, has been in the finance space for now uh, 22 odd years. Uh, and he's currently CFO designate at JSW Steel. Uh, Swayam's career has spanned multiple industries, both old economy, new age, as well as, um, you know, across industries as well. So um, a very warm welcome to you, Swayam. Uh, yeah, it's it's great to have you here. No, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me here. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the idea of, uh, you know, doing this, it was very simple. We wanted to, um, you know, create a platform where, uh, finance professionals can learn from the best in the business. Um, it's a, a lot of my own learning has come from that way, and I feel like uh, this can be a great platform for the finance community. Uh, and the intent is to, uh, you know, bring folks across industries and across uh, geographies together, um, and and really get them to understand the mind behind some of the leaders uh, that operate in the space. Um, yeah, and nobody better than, than to have you here. No, thank you. I mean, I don't know if I, you know, I belong to that best mind category, but it's a great initiative. Yeah. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Fantastic. Uh, so I would love to perhaps start with uh, just learning a little bit about you, right? How did your journey start? Uh, what was your early childhood like? Um, did you always know you'd enter finance? Uh, talk us through a little bit of that. Uh, sure. So, uh, not many people know, but I grew up in a very small town in Bihar, uh, in a ultra conservative middle income family. Both my parents were teachers. I was the eldest in family, so you know I was most controlled. Mm -hmm. uh, grew up in a in a Hindi medium environment uh, because both my parents were teachers. You know, education was always at forefront. But then when I look back, uh, I don't think CA was ever in the agenda unless I went into my graduation. That's I moved to Banaras to do my uh, graduation in commerce and that's where CA so, sort of came through. But I always wanted to become an Air Force pilot. Oh, interesting. Yeah. If I could circle back 20 years, I probably will go back and do that. And And why was that? Why did you want to pursue? So I had, uh, I had a relative, uh, a mama who was in Air Force and, uh, you know, I grew up admiring him mm. and uh, the lifestyle, you know, they have. And of course, if you watch Top Gun, mm. then you add to it. So it was it was really one of those childhood dreams. And uh, yeah, but now here I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, not an Air Force pilot, but certainly uh, someone who's made big waves in the finance, uh, corporate finance space. So uh, interesting. And uh, you know, when you did get into CA and, you know, eventually decide to start your career, I think you started with LNT Finance, if I'm not wrong. LNT. Uh, LNT, rather. LNT Finance didn't exist then. At that time, LNT, mm. LNT Finance didn't exist. And um, was that, again, a conscious choice? Did it happen by chance? No. So, look, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, if I look at my childhood, I was never the studious kind. Mm. But I always ended up getting good scores. So, I was a ranker in CA. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, it all happened. So LNT sent me, you know, and in basically to appear in an interview, I decided to appear and few other companies. And, you know, somehow it's it was my dad who decided that, you know, LNT me jao, LNT then was one of the top three conglomerates in India, right? And that's which, how I... Which year was this? That was 2001. 2001, okay. Got it. So that's when I became CS. So I landed in LNT. I... It was not really a conscious call. I was too young to make any conscious call then. But uh, after LNT, yeah, part of my life was planned. Part yeah. happened. And you held various positions across companies and industries. Um, how did you think about your career? Or if you look back, you know how much of it was you know planned versus unplanned? 
what was your thought process behind right. how you shaped your life so let me break it down into two parts the early part of my career which is lnt then to asian pains where i was almost 8 years uh these moves were not really planned i mean they just happened so i was almost 3 years with lnt and you know asian pains came through asian pains then was rated as one of the best employers yeah. to work for in india and i just jumped but the subsequent ones mm. you know for example i was uh with philips in singapore i was cfo for their consumer business in 2017 18 you know i had to take my next decision and you know there was no role for me in singapore or in apac for me in philips because next role would have been in amsterdam and i had two twin daughters identical twins they were 6 years old and that was a decision you know very consciously taken that it's time we go back because you know a lot of my upbringing i mean where i am has to do with how i was brought up and uh, after living so many years away from india i realize i'm not giving that to my kids so the point i'm making is subsequent moves were by choice mm. including for ola i mean i had seen established industries ola came through and ola was very exciting i mean the 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 dream from bhavish agrawal uh, on scooter side as well as you know what was done and what could have been done i found it very exciting and uh, you know that's when ola happened i also realized i'm then i was only 41 that you know before i die i should try a startup but i'm glad i made those decisions because uh, you know they teach you a lot you see very different spheres you know capability energy culture people and it it helps make you who you are yeah fantastic and um you know you talked about sort of making these conscious choices to reach where you are today and if you contrast you know all of these companies that you you know been at right was there something common across all of them that you would say that you that drew you to them right i'm sure there was something that drew you to these companies over time and uh if you reflect back now uh, of course everybody has their own culture but did you pick up any commonalities across these companies so of course there are commonalities but you discover them after you are inside but you know if if i look back at my career i have not repeated an industry mm uh i think it's a little bit of who i am uh i like you know i mean how steel is made i find it very exciting mm. and so was you know how for example shared mobility is driven and what mm. kind of market it could be but i think what binds them for me i mean my pre checklist includes a bit of culture mm. uh culture more on you know governance and ethics side because that's also one of my personal value so that's something i try to definitely check also culture on people side mm. you know if i look around the organizations i have worked for uh there are big you know super organization like asian paints or philips you know where where everybody is equal i mean a european company everybody is equal but then i've also seen lnd earlier days of lnd where you know to go to your manager's room you have to you know take pre appointment and so there was less access versus a startup you know where speed and execution is key everything else comes later so it's really those you know the dna of the organization is what i try to see but what draw me there is really you know what they can offer yeah and a lot of them so for example philips was really to get a global exposure which is what i got yeah asian paints uh, was early so let me skip but i'm glad i was you know 7 yeah. 8 years with asian paints but vedanta for example i was cfo of hindustan zinc for 3 years it was to get into you know one of the large companies which is listed so it was really listing entities exposure yeah so there are different reasons yeah interesting and uh, uh so a lot of it i gather was to do with you know learning at some level for you right to yes. be able to get different exposures which eventually allowed you to learn different facets of uh, you know uh, or develop different skill sets in your domain um you know when you think about 
you know, when you, like for, for professionals today, when they think about their career, right? Um, one of the things that I've sort of heard from a lot of CFOs and finance leaders is it becomes very critical to not just be in the finance function, but actually also learn business and be on the operating side. Um, how true is that in your view? Uh, did you ever get that opportunity? Do you feel like um, it's worth doing? It's uh, it's in my you know playbook. It's number one thing to take. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you are a finance professional or a marketing professional or you know commercial guy. You really have to understand how business work. So, for example, you know what is iron ore versus coking coal proportion and how it gets blended and what is ash factor. You know. All of this you have to understand and more so for finance guys because, you know, everything gets done in operation mm. has an impact on your cost, for example. And, you know, steel industry cost is key. And then also on the customer side. So, you know, who are we selling to? What kind of channels do we have access to? Where we lead? What kind of pricing strategy we follow? So, I think you raised a very important point. Uh, I personally have always taken interest. And after spending 23 years in industry, I think this is this is probably one differentiator, you know, which probably would define, yeah, a complete CFO versus others. Mm -hmm. uh, I think gone are the days where CFOs were finance domain experts mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, essentially focused on banking and accounting. The people I meet today, the people I have worked with, the people, you know, I admire around me are all who understand business as much as any other person in the management. I think it's a fundamental skill to have. You know, while I've seen a lot of uh, leaders talk about this, but even today career paths for finance professionals, you know, CAs who graduate and they join finance, they tend to sort of stick to finance as a, you know, as a vertical career path. Um, where does the challenge come in practically implementing this? Or do you see more and more companies now beginning to acknowledge this and therefore give them exposure across business? So I think, uh, you know, it, it partly depends on the type of organization, but I think more and more companies are acknowledging this. I mean, just to give you an insight, my first job at LNT, so LNT hires fresh CAs mm. only in corporate audit. And the objective is they will get they will see all the businesses. You know, LNT had cement then and EPC and engineering construction. And then you land in a role. But the idea is, you know, first three years, you actually understand the organization. This is something, you know, at least the organizations I have worked for and now I'm in a position to take some of those decisions, we, we are very actively doing. So a fresher batch which comes in, spends some time in a factory, mm. uh, you know, gets exposed to commercial function. And this we are trying to institutionalize even here in JSW Steel. Oh, that's fantastic. That's actually a great way to think about it. Just uh, give them those exposures early on that uh, help them develop that appreciation. Um, yeah, because otherwise you're very disconnected from business right? than you have. And once you have done the, those two years, it teaches you a lot. Uh, you know, more than what you have studied when you were in college. Also helps you become a better person. You are, you know, a problem solver. You actually have more empathy to, for example, you know, a customer who needs more credit is not just digital, you know, reaction for you. You understand why. Yeah. And also after having spent those first two, three years, you grow a little bit and having seen whatever path you choose from there on, whether you want to become a SME or you want to be go into general finance, it is more measured in my view. Yeah. If you if you look back at you know your career, what would you say are um what is your fondest sort of memory um or what you would consider as one of your proudest moments? Yeah, there'll be a few, but I think all of them relate to people. Um so my fondest memory was when I was leaving Singapore and uh, it was my last day. And the whole floor, I mean, part of the floor where finance it was completely redone by my team. Whole night. Of course, you give farewell to people, you leave. But that was very special. What was also memorable for me is what people spoke there. Mm. Uh, you know, people talked about things uh, which I didn't remember. 
But then, you know, I'll use an example. Somebody, you know, during crunch period of annual operating plan prep mentioned that you let me go two days in a row because, you know, my son was going through some chemotherapy and some major hospitalization. You know, things make an impact on people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, those are the moments which actually are your earnings. I mean, I personally think so. Yeah. So, so those, I mean, there will be a few, but, you know. And these are tough calls, right? Like you talked about being in crunch time and allowing people to take leave at that time. And these, you know, in that moment, obviously all, uh, you know, instinct is to sort of, you know, do what, yeah, fix it, right? Do what needs to be done. But it you need to have a certain level of courage to take those calls and, I think it's admirable that you were able to. You know. One is courage, but also you know empathy. I think it's it's. Uh, I mean, if I look at my last twenty three years, it's something I have developed. Mm. I mean, nobody is born with it. Mm. But it it, I mean, we are finance guys, so it creates a very large asset. If you do this right, and if you do it with uh, you know right belief, mm. uh, you have you build great teams. Uh, you actually build teams who are, you know, motivated to take a step more mm. versus people who just want to do their, you know, day shift. I have seen some amazing thing happening because, you know, you could bind the people together. Mm. As individuals performing, as teams performing. And this is my, you know, probably largest belief that, you know, anybody who has spent let's say 10 to 15 years and going into mid to senior management, this is a must-have skill. If you can't bring, take your team together, if you can't if you can't create opportunities for them, if you are not listening to them, yeah, uh, yeah the success will be short-lived. That's interesting that you talk about it, um, you know, from that perspective because I think somewhere, uh, and this obviously goes back to leadership styles and then there are leaders... And there are organizations where le- it's very clear that, you know, the thinking is happening at the leadership level and then, we you know, they need executors below, right? We'll just go ahead and execute. Um, and that can feel like it's devoid of empathy sometimes uh, because you're like, look, yes, of course, at a personal level, you can still empathize. But, you know, just let's say problem solving in general, right? Like now, one way of problem solving is to sort of, you know, hear what's coming up from the ground, uh, empathize with it, and then sort of, create a solution along with them uh, versus the other way is to sort of go like, look, you know, I know the market, I understand the customer and and therefore, you know, let's just take this and run with it. Um, now, obviously, there's no blanket right or wrong, but how do you think about decision making in context of, you know, empathy, uh, right? Because, yes, empathy at a personal level, you know, we all, you know, subscribe to it most likely um, or we at least try to but empathy from a decision making perspective gets a bit tricky um, so how do you how do you think about it? I think that? what you mean is empathy from a result perspective so uh, empathy is not leniency it's uh, okay so let me answer the question first a decision making framework is very simple um, number one decisions have to be taken it starts from there uh, I generally follow an 80-20 rule you know, 70%, 80%, if I get conviction right that this is the direction to go, then I would move. I would ask my team to, you know, go forward. Uh, I've also learned over a period that, you know, while you are on that decision path, there will be moment of doubt. Uh, so, you know, just hang in there till you are certain that that was wrong path chosen. But it's really taking decisions taking decisions fast. I mean, if I look at a version of myself 10 years earlier, I would wait for 98% of information to come before I could say yes. I would be very comfortable, you know, at the beginning of my career if I'm not asked to make that decision. Mm. To a point where decision has to be taken uh, without delay and sometimes has to be taken purely on conviction. Then you create sort of, a, you know, boundaries against which you will measure that decision. Take a Kipix, you know, you might not have all approvals in place and you still have to sort of take those first steps. You measure them. But, sorry, just to interrupt there, right? Uh, so when you talk about building conviction and decision, 
let's say you've reached the 80% level now at that point do you spend time creating that buy in with your team as well or is it more about hey guys let's execute this uh because look there is a trade off there is a trade off on speed right now you might if you want to drive consensus that could take a while it may not but it could so you know that how do you manage that trade off no it's a very interesting question so uh there are some decisions success of those decision depends on certain stakeholders by so there it's not really building consensus it's part of decision making you have to make sure there are people on board yeah who understands you know direction this decision could go in but there are also decisions or part of that decision making could be an outcome which need to be delivered by a certain time and then you have sort of you know set of people who need to execute it again you have to communicate right uh ideally consensus should be there but uh, it's really the objective i mean sometimes for example you know if we take a decision i mean we should be trying to automate our entire uh, fpna dashboard you know not everybody would see its value immediately mm. so those sometimes you have to politely push through uh without being too aggressive uh but then you help them see its value and along the path they do and then you know then it just becomes faster and more effective what's been the toughest decision that you had to take uh if you look back uh which involved let's say the organization or your team uh and and how did you sort of you know, what was your approach towards it yeah so there would be a couple of them uh, one of them was personal uh so you know i have grown over these years and one of the things i have always held is my value system personal value system uh and that was question mark in one of my organizations and it was a decision for me to you know make if i want to continue accepting mm uh or if i want to sort of move on it was a very difficult decision because a great place you know great rapport with uh, the entire management team promoters so it took some time i still took that decision i'm proud of it i did move on uh so that is one but you know there are other decisions as well i mean in philips so i was responsible for apac and we had very large finance team then you know we started setting up a shared service very large shared service and that would mean you know people losing their jobs and i was extremely uncomfortable knowing the impact it will have across these countries but i started to engage people early uh created a method where at least optically you know you are differentiating in good performers versus not so good made sure that you know good performers even though the roles become redundant are placed somewhere and the other who had to you know be sort of had to let go uh i actually approved a separate budget which allowed them to have career counseling uh in fact use my personal contacts for some of them in singapore uh yeah but it was a very tough decision i mean at a personal level i still remember i didn't sleep well first two nights after i knew that it can't be avoided and this was a call that was left to you to take whether you want to consolidate and and therefore uh, like create a shared service center or was it any way a management call and it was more around how do you execute yeah so it? how global companies work is uh, you know once in a while you would suddenly have somebody looking at fixed cost yeah and saying 20% out yeah and then the execution communication yeah all of them is left to let's say yeah. you know down the ground yeah so had to be done yeah interesting yeah was was that was there um di- like was it difficult to reconcile with the idea of you know letting people go was i mean how did you come to terms with it no i uh, i yeah i found my reason uh to explain it to myself uh 
because you know business a part of business was not doing well mm. and that would you know if that goes down everybody goes down yeah uh, so once the decision was clear the yeah. whole focus on how to execute it yeah how to soften the impact of people who are yeah. affected but i you know after this whole thing was over i did learn a lot of so that's yeah. something you know teaches you a lot what was your biggest takeaway talk engage and you know more so than prescribed mm. uh there will be moment of outburst there will be because you know every individual who is part of your team has a different you know financial family situation right and you might not know about and you know try to minimize the impact i mean this is all you can do yeah but it's really you know people are so i've heard cases where you know on a zoom call 2000 people were fired i think it's just the execution right it shows lack of empathy yeah yeah i mean you got to do it you got to do it but there's a way of doing it i, I suppose yeah have you uh, you were just on this to- i find this topic of decision making very fascinating so i'm going to delve a little deeper uh and and there's a lot to learn on, on this um have you encountered situations where you feel there are you know potentially two paths both potentially making sense uh, right um i mean they're very rarely wrong like if it's very clearly right or wrong there is no decision to be made but when there are two right paths potentially what's you know have you encountered a situation like that first of all and you know what was your decision framework at that time yeah uh so and i mean it's something finance professionals see very often bad news do you give now or do you wait for the quarter to end because both are right you know your situation could change uh and you could actually end up recovering mm if i use this example i have always uh, believed in being very open if there is a risk while the risk could be mitigated and everything will be hunky dory risk need to be expressed yeah so yeah i mean the situation like this you basically go with your instinct yeah and which is informed by your personal value system at some level right right, right. yeah what are the top two or three things that sit in your you know personal value system personal integrity and personal integrity is not uh, you know a lot of people use a narrow definition of it it's thought about money it's really about anything you do mm. you know you start a project uh integrity means you do with you know right heart mm. you want it to work i mean that's the largest if you ask me um uh, yeah i mean everything revolves around it yeah fair so so i'm you know i'd love to learn a little bit about uh when you look at all the people you worked with over these years uh, in your team especially what according to you has differentiated you know the really great ones from let's say the good ones right especially keeping you know the finance function in mind um anything that stood out uh, i mean of course functional skills are one thing but beyond that right so you know i think what stands out for me uh you know the talent which i would call great is sort of people who are result driven mm. uh high conviction positive body language again strong value system mm I mean these are the people I've generally seen doing exceptionally well you know result driven out you know basically orientation of what will be the outcome would be the people yeah do you have a way of uh, identifying these uh, how do you like what's your interview process like or you know, what's what's your way of identifying these folks because by the way you know just for context this is a question that i personally grapple with you know and i'm sure a lot of leaders do as well so um you know would love to get some insight on how you so you know you can do it two ways one observe uh you know somebody with a uh, very positive body language you know doesn't have to be very 
let's say skilled communicator but somebody who brings that positivity that's a vibe you get when you talk mm. uh somebody who is measured in the conversation uh but also you can ask you questions you know for example i ask what did you change in your last role it's an open ended question but you know puts a lot of people to think yeah because uh questions like these with that you know it gives you a vibe i mean you get a sense of course technical and education is given otherwise yeah. that interview is happening so yeah yeah and then what have you heard like what's a great answer according to you you know when you ask that question of what have you changed what do you look for you know in that answer yeah so you know what i look for is somebody who is not holding st- status quo somebody who is not follower of let's say an sop Mm. somebody who you know who can use first principles somebody who could see that you know despite something being done this way 20 years it can still be bettered and uh, i look for any such trigger i mean i don't expect that you know the person to have made change mm. but i'm looking for somebody who could spot that this can get better i see a problem here yeah that's that you know that's my first tick and is that something you expect from even the junior most folks absolutely mm. absolutely i mean you know people for example sometime when i'm talking to freshers or you know even one year two year post qualification i sometimes ask them how did you study differently i mean you know what would you what are the one or two reasons because you did well in your studies how did you do it that gives me a lot of sense you know there's very clever guys out there yeah yeah interesting uh and and what would you say you know so i you know one of the questions i love to ask is about failures right like um uh, what is it that you failed at in the past and i think more than the answer it's you know how they a you know what example do they take but you know also what they learn from it right um uh, you know in a way it tends to give a sense of you know what is their grit you know and how much of grit do they possess um i don't know if it's needed in the finance function as much but uh, is that something that oh no it's a, it's a very important one to ask actually mm. uh because uh, it's also you know it reflects back on somebody's ability to have self realization i think awareness is important right yeah so but it, it does happen in finance i mean yeah. and in fact if you ask me i'll tell you five things where i failed but everything taught me something yeah yeah while we're on the topic what do you have like you know what, what do you consider as your biggest uh, point of failure in life and then it's now you're asking me to divulge a secret <laughs> <laughs> the second biggest for us <laughs> so uh, there are many uh i was running a very large transformation for philips and that transformation involved you know me engaging local management and leadership that project you know missed deadlines multiple times i only realized later that its root cause is you know the the narrative is not clear hmm i'm just trying to execute uh i have not gotten people on board because i'm just trying to execute that was you know sort of early part of my career but it taught me a lot but that project was a failure mm. i made sure next one is not yeah fantastic okay um uh maybe we'll mix things up a bit right now uh there is a small segment we have which we call rapid fire um i'll throw a few questions at you and uh, let's see how you fare sure yeah okay hold on okay um when you're not working um what do you do to unwind i play squash badminton or run or spend time with my twins twin daughters how old are they by the way they are 11 now oh wow fantastic what is an app you can't live without and you can't say whatsapp linkedin or yeah linkedin got it what was the last book that you read yeah i read a very interesting book it's uh, called man's search for meaning by viktor frankl it's uh, 
it's a book about you know finding the purpose uh and the book has you know sort of backdrop of second world war concentration camp and the person was locked there with you know no outlook of what will happen you know if he's going to die there and what it teaches you is you know what nobody can take away from you is your choices you can choose to stay positive you can choose to say stay hopeful and you know that gives you a very different type of strength and which can allow you to overcome what otherwise is seemingly extremely gloomy that's probably that's going in my list for sure now yeah if you could have dinner with anyone in the world who would that be and why nirmala sitaraman <laughs> well uh i'm i mean i'm awestruck by the way she has handled the country's finances after covid i mean we are you know depending on who you ask 3 and 1/2 to 4 trillion economy today we were 2.2 10 years back she has a very large role to play and you know the reason i put her name is just a very personal thing her initial interviews you know she she was less confident and i have seen some of the you know press conferences her first budget but look at her now yeah Sashi Kanta Das would be another. Yeah, fantastic. What is one quote or mantra that keeps you motivated in life? Yeah. Uh, so there are a few songs on this. It's Karma. Uh, yeah. What basically what you give is what you get returned. Something I have always believed. Mm. And. Uh, so when you are going through a tough patch if you know that you know you have generally done the right things mm. it gives you strength that this will also pass yeah got it um what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received hang in there <laughs> never give up hang in there <laughs> and uh, what's a common myth about corporate finance that you'd like to debunk that uh, it's only for super brainy mad genius it's not mm. it's not you just have to find your love for it if you weren't in finance what would be your profession air force oh yeah you already answered that so that's fair and what's the one piece of advice you'd give to a new cfo believe in yourself i mean I see a lot of them these days and I meet them. There are ups and downs, you know, when your chips are down, there is a lot of doubt. And uh if you know starting point is right and you know if you have taken a courageous decision, hang in there and believe. Mm. And it doesn't matter how this comes out, but you'll come out stronger and it'll teach you something. Most likely it'll work out the way you want. and it is related to the point uh, do you feel cfos are best positioned to eventually become ceos in companies yes more than like so the conventional wisdom was like somebody who's risen to the ranks in sales you know they tend to eventually lead companies or lead businesses uh, but do you feel finance leaders are equipped so i link back to an earlier question where knowing business how important it is yeah and i think the new age cfos are more intertwined in business and how actual business work in my view you will start to see and you already see many of those cfos are taking over as ceo so i'm a very strong believer of that because even when you are cfo you are sort of you know co running the business with ceo and if you understand business if you understand nuances if you understand you know the variables external internal you anyway understand cost but uh, it also depends on individual's personality because mm. not everybody is suited to be you know doing a job which requires a lot of external interaction 
but i think cfos are naturally suited to do in most cases that's interesting but do you feel like uh, the professionals coming out of the ranks today they aspire like in the finance function in particular do they aspire to become a cfo or a ceo i mean the finance professional obviously aspire to become cfo but as they grow some of them you know start to believe that they could actually move into general business mm. so as i said it's also the personality yeah. uh, because that dictates very largely how you know how you grow yourself over your yeah. career yeah you want to spend the time you spend in business time understanding nuances the time you take out to go meet customers the time you know you take out to actually sit in those process plants because within finance professional you know there are smes who knows the job is defined a to z and there are people who are curious so i think it's the other one yeah you know are have higher probability yeah to move to a general management role eventually curiosity is a big one right i, I think just i personally you know value that trait a lot in people if they have that it's one of the core values that we have as a company as well um tough to identify sometimes uh but uh, i i don't know if in again you know with and maybe this is my perception but finance professionals you expect them to be like specialists in their respective functions um if you had to pick between somebody let's say who's done a general management kind of role or let's say has been in a plant has a ca degree has the credentials uh, versus someone who's been a specialist um of course one let's say the the one in the general uh, function shows more curiosity would you then pick that person for a finance function no so it depends on which role within finance uh i mean if if i have to just pick one people one person out of two you know one brings sme other general i would always pick general not because the curious only because of curiosity but also you know the experience the the exposure that person brings in uh but to fill a role it depends on the role yeah. so a tax you know role will be filled by a tax guy sure sure and but i do have an affinity to this other side got it they are you know they bring the problem solving they are you know result driven they are the special in more business partnering kind of roles i'm guessing business partner fpna you know yeah. those roles where these people fit better yeah got it fantastic so swam i'd love to pick up uh this is my personal favorite topic of technology and finance um you know we at cashflow are at the intersection of technology and finance and we're big believers in what technology can do in the finance domain over the coming years uh i'd love to get your perspective you having sort of seen um the last couple of decades across these companies what is your view of how technology can impact finance big time it already is so again if i go back uh, how you know fna as a function was run 15 years back versus today a very large changes which has already happened i mean the whole shared service related automation anything which is less value add for example processing an invoice yeah. or you know processing a transaction or employee claim it's already been sort of automated you mm-hmm. know you don't need a lot of human intervention it's a big shift from what i saw 15 years back if i look at business side you know the whole decision support system you know getting information right information on fingertips having right analytics in place having a dashboard where i can actually see meri raigarh ki unit mein kitna production hua aaj mm. and you know what is my coal consumption rate a lot of that is only possible you know because of you know all the digital interventions we have seen mm. and i think there is much more to come i mean i personally think within finance we have only seen a small part of what is going to happen i personally think anywhere where you know a decision individual driven decision is not needed could be automated i mean that's my hypothesis mm. unless you know somebody justifies why not and that could include anything i mean your book closing process yeah a lot you know large part of book closing process today is automated you know 
you could have auto jvs and journals and so on but my book can be closed if i create right rules so yeah there's a very very large shift today and i think it's it's for good because you are becoming more efficient uh you can take right decisions because you have right information available i think as cfo this is such a powerful tool to aid to the ceos mm. i mean my you know for example monthly business reviews are way different than what i have seen you know 15 years back mm. so the big changes are happening and they will continue to happen is there a particular area of finance that you feel has been most impacted by technology positively impacted by technology fpna in what way so i mean if you look at again i have seen a traditional mis function management information system where you know excel sheets would be crunched together and you know converted into tables which will take like 2 days numbers won't add up still you know you'll somehow present something which for example the promoter or ceo wants to see to a point where everything is live i know exactly what happened but tools are becoming so smart that i have a fair bit of predictability basis my you know production run rate basis my heat rates basis my fuel consumption basis my you know export shipments where will i end this month Mm. so performance management system i think is the biggest beneficiary i mean among the biggest there are few more uh of this big huge change in a company like jsw for instance and you worked in asian paints uh, lnt uh, arvind as well now these are all companies that historically you know haven't been technology first per se right? the industry never demanded it at least the finance function in these industries wasn't necessarily looking at technology to be a big enabler mm. do you feel like technology is getting its due from a budgeting standpoint for instance um vis-a-vis other because there's always going to be trade offs right where which areas do you invest in um where does technology feature in your packing order at jsw for instance i think very high but you know the right way to answer this question is any technology investment whether for finance or for any other function needs to have its roi and once you have roi then you create one single matrix to measure all your investment now the reason i said this is uh, there is no natural decision on putting a finance initiative first it's really a decision making process where i see most value there mm. and that's something you know naturally to an extent ensures that finance gets a large part because for example if you look at back office uh you know you have very large fixed cost base yeah. and a lot of work can just be automated so it makes sense to you know create automation there or bring right tools there also the back office is where all your payments happen yeah so you know some of those risks can be mitigated but also looking at core business you know automation of you know your digital factories uh they get you know enough investments as well but in the end the decision really is where the priorities lie and the only one matrix which i use is roi yeah but like let's take the example of back office automation versus let's say investing in you know business uh um from a finance perspective is you know does it come down to roi also in that case because it could also be you know changing the ways of working which might give you potentially some intangible benefits which you may not be able to directly quantify um or is it like there's a math behind all of it as well Yeah so no you are right i mean uh, the math is exactly not very clear for anything which is let's say which is difficult to measure but you know inherently everything can have roi yeah uh one has to just you know ask few more questions it's just that that roi will be not as authentic than a pure play you know investment and return 
so uh, you know roi does play a role but of course more of framework uh, to use um and and there are other factors as well if for example if if your system tells you that you might have a double payment risk yeah then you would plug that risk then return is actually not making those double payments yeah exactly or, yeah. or if your system throws that you know you have no way of knowing if all your environmental compliances are in place yeah so you plug them because you know not having that compliance can cost you much more and that was partly the reason i asked because you know some of the stuff that we do here at cashflow is around managing risk controlling risk around payments around you know invoice processing and that's not always easy to quantify from an roi standpoint um but you know you're sitting on a ticking time bomb if you don't plug those risks right so is there a is there a really good roi framework to justify that i mean so roi together with risk mitigation yeah is what yeah. you have to look at even cost of risk can go in roi by the way yeah yeah exactly so that you just need to use the framework appropriately there yeah makes sense what's been your um you know if you think about where we are today with respect to technology and ai being sort of beginning to sort of reach its inflection point mm. uh, do you see ai playing a big role particularly again in finance uh, and if so what would the finance function look like 5 years from today no absolutely i mean i don't think many of us fully understand potential of what ai can do uh we have all experienced it i already see few ai use cases for example in our shared services uh you know just to use an example predicting uh you know if certain type of invoices could go wrong and may require one more level of checking uh use cases in treasury so you know again predicting a specific let's say combination of options hmm i mean these are very early use cases but to to answer your question on what kind of jobs would be at risk will be a difficult one but i think many jobs could be at risk at least the jobs which are uh, which are you know which are let's say defined by a rule so anything to do with processing any yeah. any back office for sure will be at risk but i think the opportunities which is also coming together with it is people who understand ai you know can work with these newer age tools yeah would be in demand yeah so you know every time we have internal conversation around because this is a very hot topic you know what kind of jobs can go uh i i keep telling them that you know upskilling upskilling is key yeah because i personally i mean i don't think uh the jobs which requires a lot of decision making which are not predictable uh in next 5 10 15 years or maybe later that probably are not at risk uh but all mundane jobs a lot of you know i said book closing can be done potentially could be a risk but what could also happen is some of those jobs taken over by ai could create bandwidth at top that could create you know more linear organizations getting created but it's it's a bit far out i think what is real now in next few years 5 7 years is really these processing tasks shared services you know all the back office treasury related work even basic report preparation in fpna a lot of accounting you know transactional part mm. these these would you know would be a risk when it comes to let's say ai taking over is this an active is leveraging ai like an active topic it only at jsw or is it an area that you feel you know at least for the time being may not be immediately relevant but we need to keep an eye on it perhaps a year down the line start looking at it no so we are looking at you know for example machine learning tools uh, we are actually deploying some of them and uh, you know when machine learns enough it could have you know some sort of intelligence build i think yeah it could get built on that so for example uh, today as i said predictability right 
so an ml can use your past data to predict likely failure right yeah ai goes a le- level above i mean with right data you could be more accurate so we are doing few things but it's also something you know we keep debating internally if mm. there are real use cases available mm. but i think for ai it's too early uh, what we are focusing in in you know other digital tools and adoption yeah. of them uh as we speak there are professionals coming out of you know the ca institute and you know early on in their careers um you know who've been trained and who've learned a certain set of skills today right um what would be your you know message to these folks you know given that let's say you know given how fast technology is moving uh, what would be some of the key messages you would want to convey to them i mean one message which uh, which i you know keep communicating is reskilling you know uh, the institute products i mean people who come out are you know nourished bend in a certain way uh and that makes the first batch of ca no matter what path you choose you want to become an sme you want to go into general management always keep looking for opportunities which you know which gives you an additional skill that's one the other big input to them is becoming tech savvy and what i see more and more you know the the you know current generation they are by design more tech savvy but this is relevant for anybody who is you know working today to be aware what tools are mm. uh you know if you look at 10 15 years back people who know sap are considered tech savvy but it's not true anymore so you know being aware all the tools which are available yeah. using right analytics i mean that's again part of reskilling but that's something i you know yeah. said input them yeah perhaps there's a message here for the institute as well right do you feel like they need to change their curriculum in some form uh, i think they're doing it what is happening i think they're doing it and uh, eventually it will you know it will reflect what market needs yeah they're doing it yeah got it um great uh i i think um if i had to just you know some closing thoughts right um if i had to ask you uh what would be your um let's say looking forward right uh what would be your outlook for the country uh over the next decade or so um of course you know we're talking about growth and there is a lot of optimism there um is there something that you worry about uh for this country going forward no so i'm 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 very positive about what lies for india 5 to 10 years from now maybe longer uh first reason for that is if you look at india unlike china which is an export driven economy we are a domestic consumption driven economy mm. if you look at you know some key data points i work in steel right today india per capita steel consumption is about 95 kg a person the global average is 250 240 to 250 mm. china is an outlier with 600 kgs look at any sector you know i think the room to grow within country and consume is very large mm. so that this growth which we have seen i mean quarter 2 gdp numbers have come out at 67.6% i think this trajectory will continue for next 3 5 7 years at least uh yeah and and i think other strength we have as a country is really capability i mean the people the you know we are a younger country so we can offer talent and you know we already lead when it comes to service side of you know industry and export i think manufacturing is becoming another very large opportunity not only for only for domestic consumption but also if you look around a lot of global companies are you know talking about china plus 1 I think we naturally stand to benefit we have a very stable regime our you know uh investment regime is becoming simpler we have a stable government uh, you know skill levels are very high and government is doing a lot to stimulate it so this could actually make us also an export hub i mean mm. you know replacing china so i'm very positive about india in fact uh, i'm very bullish about india now only thing 
one or two things which I think you know could possibly derail us. I I have you know I have zero doubt that this will not happen. It could just take longer, mm-hmm. and the reasons for them could be you know for example next year we have elections you know if the government is not stable. Uh, also China you know. The China is slowing down. We will have to see where it goes. Third could also be the fact that you know our you know economy still has a very large import dependence, and you know in economy everything is linked uh, dollar rupee. So you know factors like for example this geopolitical war. So far I don't see an impact on India, but uh, you know for example oil prices. You know it's our largest import bill here. Yeah. If it goes north, you know our balance of payment has a gap. So these, you know, minor trickles could come, but ten years from now, I'm very bullish about India. It's the right time to be in India. Fantastic. On that note, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much, Swayam. This has been a super, super engaging conversation. Um, super insightful as well, and I really appreciate you taking your time. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Ankur. Thank you for hosting me. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>